Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is a wonderful to be back, Owen, and we're nearly through with our summer series. We've had quite the month. Mm-hmm. And what a way to celebrate the second last instalment, which is uh, two ways to start a business in 2024. There's a reason that we've left this to now, and it was very popular in 2023. Yeah, when I was going, you've probably forgotten your Spotify wrapped by now, but when I was going through last year, the most popular episode that was streamed on Spotify was Owen's 30-minute guide to starting a business. So (laughs) I'll link that episode in the show notes if anyone wants to go back and listen to that. But we thought we'd chuck in a little bit of small business for this summer series, especially because we have a really good free business course on Rask Education that anyone can check out. And I know it's been helpful for a lot of people, especially listeners of the business podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you that don't know, we have the Australian business podcast as well. Uh, It's an interesting thing that you said on Spotify because on the Australian finance podcast, the majority of people listen on an Apple device. So they don't use Spotify. Uh, this is an Apple podcast or something like that. And when I say majority, I mean like 60% or more. But over on our business podcast and on the property podcast, on those two channels, Spotify is dominant. And so it's a really interesting thing that when it comes to investing, we tend to be on Apple devices. And when it comes to things of business or property, there's a big Spotify cohort. So um, I was delighted to see that so many people were interested in that that kind of like business starter uh, episode, I guess. Um, we do have resources on that as well. The business course that Kate referred to is actually designed for business starters, but also people that are relatively new to business, like in the first five years. Um, and then obviously, um, we have some resources available in the show notes as well that you can check out. So this episode too. Yeah. So I guess today the plan was to give a bit of a crash course on why people start businesses and some of the ways that you could think about starting a business this year if that is something that you're interested in. And Owen, can anyone start a side hustle? I think just about anyone can start a side hustle, Kate. Uh, The key difference between a side hustle and a business, probably the way most people think about it, is that for many people, a side hustle is something that you can do ongoing or for like a, a little while. Uh, but it doesn't consume the majority of your time. Whereas a business, quote unquote, business in people's minds is something that you do full time or that you own um, and it produces income for you and produces passive income or active income if you've got to work in it. Uh, Whereas a side hustle, people do it for different reasons, but typically in a side hustle, it might be something that takes less of your time uh, or you do for a specific reason. So, for example, if you're saving for a house deposit, mm-hmm. you might start a business. You might drive for Uber on the side. Uh, it's not something you want to do forever, for example, uh, but you do it now or maybe you go on contract or you do something like you start a small business, like a marketing business, if that's what you're into and you help other businesses, whatever the case may be. Um, but if you plan to turn it into a full-time business, uh, there is a different set of steps you can take, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, maybe the first place I'd like to start is just kind of like maybe we can start with uh, Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant. So, in this book uh, called Rich Dad Poor Dad, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who's a pretty well known author, uh, went over the four different quadrants. So, just imagine a piece of paper divided into four corners and squares. So, in the top left corner, you've got your salary. This is, you know, your PAYG. Um, in this case, uh, you earn your income every week fortnight or month, and that just gets paid straight into your bank account. The tax is already withheld. Superannuation is paid for you. Uh, and that's pretty good. You know, it's consistent. It's reliable. Here in Australia, there are a lot of protections and entitlements in place for people that work on a salary. The next quadrant down to the bottom left would be uh, your contracting. So this may be where you, for example, uh, do a side hustle. Or you take what you already do in your career and you just turn it into where you work as a subcontractor. So tradies, this is the most common form of a tradie. Uh, So like a carpenter, they work uh, for a builder or multiple builders or their boss. 
but they do it and they have to invoice um, their their boss for effectively. Now, there are certain rules around this, but the basic gist is that you are a sole trader. A sole trader is a type of small business where you can employ people if you want, but at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're basically running your own race. You have to pay your own tax and these types of things. So if you're doing mm. that, you want to probably keep like 20 or 30% of your income in a separate bank account to pay to the ATO. Otherwise, you'll end up with a bill shock at the end of the year. A lot of those uh, small businesses also have to pay their own super or want to pay their own super. So you might pay 10% of your wage into super, but you have to do that yourself via BPay. The benefit of being a contractor over a small business, uh, over a salary, is that you have more flexibility. So, for example, if you wanted to work really hard, you want to work more hours, or you want to take on different jobs or work for different builders in the case of a carpenter, you can do that. Um, and you might earn a bit more per hour. So, for example, uh, in the case of, say, a carpenter, we'll stick with that, you might go from earning $40 per hour on the salary to earning $60 per hour as a contractor. For mm-hmm. the, the the companies that you work for and you contract to, and you send your invoice with your ABN, ABN on it, the benefit for them is they don't have to pay you super. They don't have to worry about all the other things that come with uh, having an employee. Um, and the benefit for you is that you can earn more upfront and you can do that all that stuff yourself if you choose to. In the third quadrant, this is in the top right-hand corner, we have your own business. So just to recap, we've got salary, contracting, and then your own business. When it comes to starting your own business, it's incredibly difficult, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and some businesses do fail. Uh, but Australia is built by small businesses. We have, a t- we have over 2.4 million small businesses in Australia. Uh, so that would mean that basically just under one in 10 people in Australia probably have a business. Some people might have multiple businesses, but that's just for rough figures. And this is where basically you commit your time and your resources to running a business that works for you. Um, it's a truly wonderful thing. And this is one of the ways where you can grow seriously wealthy if you get it right. So it's natural that we would put that put this episode on the Australian Finance Podcast because it is one of the four things that can make you a lot of money and probably the most money in your life. The fourth thing is where you are an investor. So this is where you invest in other people's businesses, basically. And there are many different ways to do it, but what we know most commonly is you buy shares, either via your brokerage account or ETFs, where all those shares are bundled up. And the benefit of being an investor over a business owner is you don't actually run the business. So Kate, for example, if you go and buy Apple shares or Telstra shares, you don't run Telstra, you don't run Apple. But what you do have an entitlement to is a claim on the business and you may get dividends if they are paid. And there are rules that say one shareholder cannot get a dividend, I can get a dividend and another one cannot, like they all have to be treated equitably. So if Apple pays a dividend or Telstra pays a dividend, you benefit. And there are many benefits for being an investor longer term because you simply don't have to run the business yourself. It makes so much sense that as your money grows, you would invest more in other people's businesses or other businesses rather than starting your own. But there are people out there, and I know some of them. In fact, just today, I'm interviewing someone for our business podcast who has four of her own businesses. So she's not an investor in other businesses, but she runs four of her own and has teams for each one. Uh, And she's making passive income from four different sources um, which is incredible for her. And I'd imagine she could make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, maybe even from each of them um, over the course of a year. And so that's an indication of how you can invest as well, but maybe not um, in the, on the stock exchange. So that's kind of the Kiyosaki's four principles, Kate. Um, but obviously when you hear that, you think, well, maybe I'll do a bit of everything and fair enough. I think yeah. the biggest... Sh- Biggest shame. So, there's one final thing before I throw to you is that most people spend too much of their life in the first quadrant and they don't explore the other quadrants. Because if you want passive income and you want your money to grow for you, you cannot stay in the first quadrant. It is as simple as that. You cannot stay there. That is what I'll end with. I know a lot of us are familiar being an employee. Some of us will be familiar being contractors, and many people listening are familiar with being an investor. But what are some of the reasons that you encourage people to think about being a business owner? Well, I guess my philosophy as an investor for a long time and educating a lot of people like you is that um, 
I see business, my, my kind of, my, I lean into business in that I think it solves most of the world's problems like that we have. And what, what I mean by that is like, it doesn't solve like world hunger. You obviously need governments and things like that to solve that problem. But what it does is inside of a country, it solves a lot of the problems. Um, because what we have is democracy plus capitalism. So in democracy, you appoint your government and your government works on behalf of the people. And then they set the rules that the businesses can run in and capitalism can thrive. And some people who don't understand what capitalism is say it's a bad thing. And it kind of sends a shiver down my spine. Uh, You can go back to the 1940s and 1970s to figure out why capitalism is the thing that we have and why it is the best option for countries to run. Um, But basically with capitalism, what you get is you get businesses solving problems because they earn a profit. So if you think about it, if you start a bakery business and you make really good croissants, I know there's some wonderful businesses in Melbourne that make really good croissants and I know you love <laughs> We've tried a few. bakery. Yeah. Um, if you make really good croissants, people are going to come to you and they're going to buy your croissants rather than make their own because you're solving a problem for them. Um, similarly, if you're an occupational therapist and you work with, disabil- uh, with disabilities uh, on the NDIS, the NDIS and the government has proven, well, beforehand, before there was an NDIS, the government cannot provide care for people with disabilities in Australia. And it's proven that it proved out over decades that there were some terrible and tragic things that happened. So they brought in the NDIS. And what effectively the NDIS has done is it's empowered small business owners who are OTs, physios, exercise physiologists, to get paid by the government to provide services to people with disabilities. So here again, we have businesses solving problems that the government identified. Uh, And so you can go across all of society and you can find areas where a business solves a problem for society. And thanks to capitalism, basically what happens, Kate, is if you have more than one business, they compete. And when they compete, it lowers the cost for consumers. So Mm -hmm. big picture is business owners actually solve many of the world's problems. And yet we don't really think about it like that way. That In Australia, we have this real issue where people are quick to shoot down successful people, uh, quick to with this tall poppy syndrome. It's actually remarkable how bad that is in Australia. Um, it's actually remarkable how many people try to bring down people that try and solve problems. But I think what you find is that if you're one of those people that are trying to do these things, you never do that. You're actually happy for other people to be a success because you know how hard it is. One of the brilliant things of running your own business is that you can choose to work ethically if you want to. So you've probably been in a business before where you've worked and you think that's not the right thing to do. Well, in a business, you may have to make compromises on certain things, but at the same time, you can choose if you want to work on a project or not. So you can choose if you want to work with someone who pays you a lot of money to do the quasi good thing and you're not sure about the ethics of something, you can choose to work with that person if you want to or that business as your customer or you cannot, you know, it's totally up to you. It's like when you go into a restaurant and there are people there who are very, very rude. You can say as the business owner, we'll get lost. You're not welcome here. And sure, you might get a bad Google review, but you can say, get out. Whereas if you're an employee, you might have to just cop that. I mean, sure, your business, your manager might say like step in or whatever, but at the end of the day, you can choose to spend your time how you want to because you know the implication is that you might lose some money, but at the same time, it's your choice. And that's so one of the things that goes unnoticed. Um, I won't use the full name of this policy that I have, but um, I had it at my football club as well of all places. But basically, we had this policy that we're not welcome this place is not welcoming to people who have the wrong uh, set of ethics or morals. And so um, there's a policy that we have when you're a business owner, you get to choose who you work with. And if someone isn't who you want to work with, you don't hire them. And if they are working for you, you find ways to remove them from your business. And that makes everyone happier and healthier as a result. And so you can craft the culture to suit your needs. And so These are some of the benefits of starting a business that go beyond just money. There are other things like you have the pride. If you build something, uh, in my notes, I had written down that when I used to drive past uh, certain houses or schools, my dad ran a 
pretty successful painting business. And he was always so proud to tell me, oh, I painted that school or I painted that house or these houses or I worked on that. And my grandfather, who was a carpenter, used to build things and he used to, my, my dad would say, oh, your poppy built that, your poppy built this, your poppy built that. And when you run a business, you can sit back and you can say, well, after all said and done, you know what? I left a mark on this place. I did this. I did this. And you can do that as an employee too. Absolutely. There's no, absolutely you can. But um, at the same time, there's, I don't think there's anything quite like that where you look around and you see something that you've overseen from beginning to end. It's quite special. Uh, and finally, the most obvious reason that most people get into business is money. Um, you can make a lot of money if you do it right. But at the end of the day, a lot of people can't deal with the 100,000 questions you've got to answer to make a successful business. And mm -hmm. so they fail. Like a lot of businesses do fail. But, you know, I've worked with businesses that make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some make millions of dollars um, just by following a few simple principles and offering a service that people want. So those are some of the reasons that you can do it. And most of them you'll see go beyond just money. But money is definitely the thing that drives a lot of people towards starting their own business. Because the flip side of money is that as if you're working a nine to five, you're getting your paycheck, you're going home, you usually don't have, maybe you've got your reputation on the line, but you don't have your own personal finances on the line. But if you're starting a small business and you're investing money into it, and maybe you've taken out a loan, you do have more to lose. Absolutely. And some of the bad sides are you could, if you start a business, uh, depending on how you start it. So if you started as a sole trader, as I mentioned before, and you take out a loan to buy a car and you injure yourself and you've got that loan you know, accruing because you can't work, you're a chippy and you've just broken your wrist, you can't work, well, what do you do? And so you do need to find ways to protect yourself. Um, and even you know, in the case of companies like directors who oversee a company can be liable for certain things if things go really bad, um, which is actually a good thing because it stops some activities that previously they could get away with. And at the end of the day, one of the big things that people, a lot of business owners don't count on is a lot of business owners, um, they, they, they tend to forget that it's not just the money that goes into the business. They actually lose the time as well. So they lose time with their family, but they also lose the time to do other things with their money. So for example, when I started RASC, and you can learn about how that came to be in our very first episode on the Australian Business Podcast, very, very first episode. Um, as I explained on that, like it's not only the money that you put into the business or other people put into the business, it's also losing wages. So in my case, losing wages for four years. You know, I was earning very good money before starting Rask and I basically had no wage for like four years. I think I paid myself maybe $500 a week for a while. Uh, if that, and so you've got to find ways to deal with that. Um, that's a hundred. If you go four years without earning a wage, and you were earning a good wage, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost income. Not to mention the money that goes into a business to then make it a success, which is probably mm. add X Y Z on top. Like there's a lot that has to happen, and a lot of risk that has to go into it in order to make a business a success. But there are some other things that people probably don't realize when they start a business. One is like all of the entitlements that you get when you are an employee. Public holidays. The government, public holidays. The government does not pay for any of that. So when a, there's nothing more frustrating for a business owner than when a politician or a union boss stands up and says, you know, we're going to raise this tax or we're going to do that on public holidays or there's going to be an RDO on this day. And you just sit there as a business owner and you're like, my profit margin is like three or four percent. How am I going to afford to give everyone a day off? <laughs> and that's what they want. Like in Victoria, everyone gets the grand final holiday off <laughs> for the AFL grand final. How ridiculous is that? Who pays for that? Business owners, because they lose all the employee, all the customers for that day because they're not working, and they have to pay for their team to have a day off. So that's a double whammy of like it's a left and a right hook. And these are the examples of where business owners again have to basically provide. And um, it's a real shame because we know if we look to the United States or throughout the world, that it's actually businesses that solve the world's problems. Like if you go onto the government website here in Australia, you get a message from Microsoft to say, congratulations, you've logged into MyGov. Not from the government. It's the business that solved the problem for the government. And I think people tend to forget that like the businesses, we need business owners 
to do what they do, to take the risk, to try and go for, you know, go for broke, so to speak, and actually try to solve people's problems so that society can function. And so when you are a business owner, you realize how hard it is to juggle all of those things and all of the employee entitlements, the superannuation, the tax and all that. It's really difficult, not to mention just running the business for a success. So there's a lot that goes on and that eventually does take its toll on business owners. That's why a lot of them will go out of business um, because they just simply cannot keep up with the demands of what they are obliged to do, but also their mental health and well-being. Um, I would say, though, that when people hear that, Kate, when people hear how difficult it can be, um, most people don't do it, and that's fine too. Um, but it's just about – it's also just about understanding the process overall of like, well, I work for a business. How can I make this business more valuable and not mm. put pressure on the business owner? And then maybe I'll get paid more. Or I, you know, I can say to the business owner, maybe we can share in something and grow. So there are other options where it's between starting a business yourself and actually playing a greater role in a business um, to take more, I guess, of the economic profit. Yeah. So what would be the first way to start a business without trying to become the next Apple or adding a whole lot of extra stress to your already busy plate? Yeah, well, um, so we've got two very similar but different ways to start a business. Um, And the reason that I named them the way they did is because Warren Buffett had this quote, which is, I don't test the water with both feet. A lot of people think that in order to start a business, you need to just jump straight in. And if you go to like any of the major rivers in Australia, you'll see signs that say, do not jump straight into the water, like diving hazard or the pool says, don't just jump straight in. Because it's risky to jump straight in. So the first thing to do is to just test the water with one foot. In the Barefoot Investor book, he called this the trapeze strategy, where you let go of one of the swings and you grab onto the next one. And you only let go of the one that you're on when you've grabbed a firm hold on the next trapeze. Um, And so basically in this instance, what you're doing is you're trying to maybe make a a side hustle. Maybe that's how you think about it at first. But here, we're not talking about like, I don't know, a nurse going and creating custom uh, cups or Christmas cards. That's not what we're talking about. To start a business professionally, what you want to do is you want to take the thing that you're already doing and you want to use those skills to then start another business in the background or at least make preparations. So one of the ways you can do this is let's say you're an electrician and you're working for someone and you've been working for them for a few years you're qualified, but you know you need to get a few tickets or potentially you know you need to get some insurances sorted and these types of things. You've got to go out and research this. The very best way to start a business is to make it as low risk for you as possible. And the way you do that is you start doing all of those you know things on your checklist, your business checklist, like who are the competitors in the market? Do I need a website? Should I get the social media handles now? Like should I go and just register those social media things? Does anyone have the business name? You can look it up online. Um, By the way, having an ABN and registering your Australian business number is not protection from anything. It is literally just a number so you can put it on your invoice. You need to check business names in the government register and you need to check um, IP Australia for trademarks and those types of things. When you create a a business on business.gov.au, they now prompt you to do those things, which is really good. But you want to check those things, even while you're working for your current employer, go and check those things to make sure that the name that you want and the domain name is the thing that you want is available. And it's not going to infringe on anyone else's copyright or well, not so much copyright, but trademarks. Um, so you can do all of that while you're working for your current employer. A lot of people think that, you know, I've been in this job for a long time. I've learned a lot. One of the best things you can do if you go down this route is don't just work for one employer, go and work for a one or two or three because you want to make sure that if you just grow up and you're an electrician and you've only worked for this one company your whole entire career and you want to start a business, you've only learned what's available to you through that employer. So if you go and work to some for someone else, you might discover that they do things very differently and there are so many better systems or th- ways of doing business that you can adopt. And so Your job is basically to learn as much as you can, learn the strategies that work, 
And if you can't go and work for someone else, just survey the industry, look around and see who's in the space, who's a competitor to my business idea, and what does each of them do really well. So, you know, you might, if you wanted to start a Australian financial podcast, which is very similar to ours. It's probably too close for copyright, but let's say you wanted to do something similar to this. Um, you could go and look at all the business category podcasts and you could be like, well, this one does this one really well. That one does that one thing really well. And this one does that one poorly. So I won't do that. And you just build this like research database that you might put in Notion or in a Google doc and you build an understanding of what it takes to be successful. Because one of the mistakes that people make when they start a business uh, is they don't know everything and yet they think they do. So they have this like confirmation bias. And one of the easiest ways to get ahead is just to replicate whatever else is working. Um, just look around and say, well, that business does that thing well and that business does that thing well. I'll just do that. Because um, the longer it takes for you to figure out, the more your business is at risk from failure. So you want to figure those things out quickly. Like There's a reason, a reason every business has their website. Even if you think TikTok is the world's best thing there's a reason every business has a website there's a reason you know every business uh uses zero or just about you know there's a reason that they do that so figure out what those are and you can do that while you work for your existing job like while you're in that assuming kate and this is the big one assuming that there isn't a non-compete in your employment clause which as someone who's training to be a lawyer yourself you know how important those are I think the interesting with the research point, Owen, is sometimes people look at all the different businesses out there that they might be interested in doing something similar. And then they go, well, if all these businesses exist in this space, is it even worth me going down this path if everyone else is already doing it? Is there room for another one? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you might find that like in your town that there are three bakeries already and the town just simply does not need a bakery. And that is actually a wonderful realization because then you might be like, well, I've just saved myself a few years, heartache, hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially. Um, and then you can make, you can, you have a choice. You can take your business idea somewhere else, or you could potentially see if you could buy one of those businesses, if you think they are successful. Uh, so there are other ideas, or you might just change your idea completely. I think one of the problems that people have is when they think about starting a business is they convince themselves that it's a great idea. But what happens in the world is the world figures you out and you get found out. Um, you know, if basically if you muck around, you get found out in business really quickly. And so I think for, for most business owners, that realization is actually really good and it shows that you've done your research properly. And um, it just means that you can go back to the drawing board. Like a lot of people have ideas for businesses, like concept ideas. So they might have like, I'm going to create t-shirts, right? And if you go online, you'll see there's no shortage of t-shirt businesses like to do funky logos and that sort of stuff. And that's a really, really hard business. And if you find that there are heaps of businesses that do that, you've got to understand what we always talk about on the show is competitive advantage. What is your reason that you can charge a higher price than the next person. Because the the example we always give on the Investors Podcast is imagine two cafes that set up right beside each other. One of them sells coffee for $5. The one next door who is exactly the same, uses the same beans, the same coffee machine, sells for $5.50. Which one are you going to choose? You're going to choose the cheaper one, right? And you will always choose the cheaper one if it's identical for as long as the other one's price is higher. And so that's capitalism in, in action. Eventually, mm -hmm. that the, the more expensive one comes down. But where it comes down to, Kate, the price falls, 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 falls until it gets to the price where the, the price of the coffee matches the cost of the coffee and you make no profit. And that's capitalism. Eventually, one of them goes out of business or both. And so what you've got to do is you've got to decide, well, if there are bakeries in my area, there are cafes. What are we going to do different? Well, we're going to have a membership. We're going to have a loyalty program. We're going to have different design. We're going to be more forward focused. We're going to be eco-friendly. We're going to be in a better location, which is one of the best things for physical businesses. Um, we're going to use an online strategy as well. We're going to use Facebook marketing. We're going to do community events. We're going to sponsor the footy club. These are just different strategies, a way that you can differentiate yourself from the comp competitors. And obviously, you want to differentiate yourself quite a bit, but you don't want to be too differentiated where your customer base shrinks so much that you cannot even get a customer. Like 
we're going to be eco-friendly, vegan, but only sell coffees in store because everyone does takeaway coffees and you have to fill in a survey before you come in the door. Something just completely crazy. And no one's going to come in. It might be different, but it's different and wrong. So mm. um, that's how you can think about that. What about our second method of jumping in with both feet? How do we go about that? Who would that be right for? Well, this, it's, this is really only right for people. So testing the water with both feet is really only right for people that can't do the first option. So if, or just simply have put themselves in a position where they don't need to do the first option. But um, in the book, E-Myth Revisited, um, Gerber, who's the author, talks about how there are basically different levels of a person in a business. And the first one is a technician. And so the, the, if you're a, I don't know, what's a good example? If you're a, say, a concreter, right? And you are really good at concreting, you do like exposed aggregate driveways, you can do uphill, downhill, like you, you do it all. You frame it out yourself, you pour the, you're really good at your job. The problem is if you were going to start a concrete business and you didn't have all those technical skills, you would have to employ someone to see, oversee everyone else to make sure that they do the job properly, right? So even if you go for this second option, you need to make sure that you have enough understanding that you can run the business successfully. But the reason you would do this second option is if you have a non-compete and you cannot run a separate business or even prepare a separate business while you're currently employed. A lot of businesses have non-compete clauses, which effectively have two different things. One is like a time barrier. So it says you cannot start a business within six months of leaving this business that competes with our business. Fair enough. The second one is like it's a radius and it says you cannot start a business within 10 kilometers of this business um, at any time for whatever restraint period, right? And so your option then is to quit basically and to start the business depending on the clause or to quit and then go start somewhere else. You've got to obviously consult a lawyer and figure that out yourself. But other people might go straight to this option if they think they have such a big idea uh, and it's proven through like research and speaking with customers and or potential customers, or they can see the option and it is so clear to them that it's it should happen. Um, you can go and you can just go straight into your business, but it doesn't mean that you can avoid all of the other things you've got to do, like research the market, the competitors, define your business strategy. The one thing you would want to do if you pursue this straight away is you would immediately want to get an expert on your side. So you want to get an accountant to set up your business correctly um, and help you potentially with um, like planning the financials. Uh, you'd want to immediately, you probably want to get a business coach. I know that's a bit self-serving for me to say, or just a mentor, like someone that's been in the industry for a while. Um, and you want to take everyone to coffee who will accept your invitation for a coffee, like all the existing business owners in the area, all the people who might give you advice on how to grow your business. And another option for people in this regard is to find yourself a co-founder. So in this option, you're basically trying to get to what we call an MVP or a minimum viable product, like a, just a product that you can sell as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Because the longer you sit in limbo, the longer your business has a chance for failure. And so in this instance, you're basically getting out there and you're trying to do everything that minimizes the risk that you run out of money or that your business idea doesn't work. And the way you do that is you just try and get as much information as, can, as you can, identify the things that work and avoid the things that don't work. The avoiding things that don't work will be a much longer list than the things that do work. I can tell you that much. Um, and you would you would want to be. You mentioned it before, financials, Kate. With both of these strategies, you're going to want some money behind you to protect yourself. So, for example, a really nice cafe just opened up near me a few months ago, and I was speaking to the business owner there, and he runs the business day to day, and he's got a business partner who does all the marketing and design and that sort of stuff for his cafe. But that guy couldn't afford to leave his other job. So they worked it out that this he would still work for his other job and at night he would and in the morning he would still do all the design work, all the marketing, all the branding, all that stuff. Uh, and the guy who left his job uh, had saved up money and could afford to leave and would work full time in the business day to day until it was at a point where they could both potentially do the job or you know find another strategy. Uh, and so finding a co-founder like that could be a really interesting idea a co-business owner for helping people that have to take the second option um, as well as finding private backers like 
getting money from friends, family, or investors uh, is a really good option when you're early days so you can de-risk the business. And like if just off, this final thing I'll say about this option is that if you think about it, a lot of people don't want to take the risk of starting a business, but they will take the risk of giving you five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and taking part ownership of your business. And uh, a, a guy I spoke to on the weekend is an electrician, um, and he, he, he didn't want to start a business, but he had money. I had, you know, 50 grand saved up and he was, didn't know what he wanted to do with it, didn't want to buy a house. And so he went to his boss who ran the electrical company and said, Hey, can I invest in the business? And in doing so, the business owner said, yes. Um, they used that money to buy another van for one of their employees. He got a pay rise and got elevated up in the business because all of a sudden the business owner was like, well, you're now a business owner as well with me. So I know you're going to do the right thing always. Mm -hmm. And so you can share in some of the business, you get paid more and you've supported me. So that was a great option for him because he didn't want to take the risk of starting a business. He just wanted to feel like he owned a business. So that's what he did. And that's a good outcome. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting if you start thinking outside of the box because I think we get very distracted by the glossy venture capital mm. unicorn businesses. But if we start thinking about how if we want to start a small business or be involved in a company we work for, there's other ways to be a business owner without having that multi-million dollar headline. Absolutely. And to be honest, like there's like this really big like – um, mirage around this industry, which is that you need to have like, you, you're going to be out there, you're going to be making a huge business and you're going to be a, a wonderful success. The best plumbing businesses make three or 400 grand a year in profit. They employ like three or four people and they're just on the street that you live on. Like they are literally all around you. And there's a reason that a lot of tradies are only five team members big is because that's kind of like the sweet spot for a lot of businesses. Start going over that, you get a HR problem, you get payroll problems, you have to start dealing with commercial builders. Like there is a sweet spot of these businesses, which are not the glamorous ones that you see in the TV, on the TV or whatever. These are the business owners that make real money and they're the business owners that live the life that they want to because they don't have a stress of 50 employees on different job sites at the one time. They don't stress about finding work because they know they've got enough that they, their team can have two months worth of work ahead of them. Those are the businesses and those are the business owners that make a shed load of money. And then when they're ready to sell, that in that case, if they're making 400 grand profit, that plumber could probably sell that business for one, one and a half, two million bucks. And so there's a payday at the end if they do decide to sell. Um, and that's where you get like serious long-term wealth creation but it doesn't have to be glamorous. It doesn't have to be the thing that's like Canva or insert name of really high profile Aussie business. And, um, you know, some of the best businesses that I come across are only like two or three employees. Uh, like seriously, that's, and that's enough for them to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, live a good work-life balance. Um, sure. There might not be backups or redundancies if people get sick or whatever, and that's the, the cost and the risk of running a business. But um, those are the businesses that really move the country forward and move the financial dials forward. And I think if anyone just listens to this episode and they think, well, I don't know if I'm on the fence about this or I don't really want to do it, is just think about ways that you can get creative where you don't have to start the business, but maybe you can support the existing business owner to do a better job and you can get paid a lot more. You might even get equity in the business and all of these types of things where there's still a payday for you in the form of dividends, in the form of if that business is ever sold, uh, in the higher salary because you get more responsibility. There is this wonderful middle ground that many people find themselves in. And um, a lot of people in corporate jobs never get that opportunity because they never get the opportunity to own part of the business. They get bonuses and those types of things, but they don't get the 10% of a business. Like I always think about this if I was buying another business and I didn't, I couldn't be there to run it every day. Whoever runs the business, I just give 20 or 30% of the profit to because that would be enough incentive for them on top of their wage to do a really bloody good job. And that's the same way that like, I hate to bring his name up again, but that's the same way Warren Buffett has built his massive, massive empire is through, he never, ever, he, I think he's ever, ever, ever done it once, bought a business and changed the CEO. You just, 
don't need to do that. And so I think if you just think about ways that you could be that person without taking all the financial risk, understanding business is a wonderful thing. Um, and it makes you more worldly in understanding of how things are actually done in society. So it's not glamorous, it's hard, but it can be super rewarding in more ways than money. There are two ways. One is do all of your prep work now, test the water with one foot to see what works. And as Kate said, if it doesn't make sense, don't do it. Find another idea, take your time, keep investing on the side. The other idea is you do have to test the water with both feet, but you still want to make sure you've minimize the risks wherever you possibly can. Uh, and there are many different ways to do that. Uh, the free business course on RASC, Kate, shares so much information. It's got a business plan. It's got HR documents. It's got how to understand your cash flow, which is a big killer, how to find people through digital marketing. It's got PDFs, it's got downloads. It's got so much. It's all free. You can check that out. Uh, you can head to my coaching website, which is owenrass.com. We have a program there as well as well as a business checklist, which is in the show notes. It's free. Um, all of these things and all these resources that will help you get started. In the last 10 years, things have really changed for business owners. There are so many resources out there. Many of them are free. Some of them are quite expensive, but many of them are free. And you can learn what you need to do fully online, places like YouTube, podcasts, etc. So make the most of them before you start. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you and the team on the business podcast answer questions on a very regular basis. So there's a, a link in the podcast player to ask a question. You can send it to the business podcast and then make sure you uh, tune into that show weekly to hear the responses. Yes. The Australian business podcast every week, twice a week, we answer questions on the Sunday show, get your questions in uh, each week before Wednesday, and you'll get a chance to have that question answered. And uh learn more as we build together. So that's it, Kate. I know I promised you a 30-minute episode. It went for 40, but uh, hopefully it was valuable for everyone and uh, appreciate you taking the time. No, I think everyone can see you're very passionate about small businesses. So hopefully more content on that in the year to come. Well, uh, we'll see everyone on the final episode of our summer series, Owen. Can't wait. It's going to be a big one. So thanks again, Kate. See you next time. 